Welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce Eve Kahn, who is going to be speaking on the artist Mary Rogers Williams. Eve is an historian and journalist specializing in art, architecture, design, and preservation. And she was weekly antiques columnist for the New York Times for almost 10 years. Eve now writes regularly for the New York Times, Apollo Magazine, the magazine Antiques, and Atlas Obscura. Based in Manhattan, she helps lead scholarly nonprofit groups, including the Grolier Club, the Grolier Club, I might not have said that correctly, the Victorian Society's New York chapter and the City University of New York's Women Writing Women's Lives. Um, as I mentioned, she is going to tell us more about Mary Rogers Williams, a forgotten Connecticut artist of the Impressionist era. And I just want to also mention that Eve's book on Mary Rogers Williams came to our attention because of a Norfolk connection. Mary Rogers Williams had a photographer writer friend named Lillian Baines Griffin, whose scoundrel father, John Baines, briefly worked with Lockwood DeForest in the metal engravings business. Lockwood DeForest was a summer resident of Norfolk. And among the uh, plaques that he produced, uh, John Baines, <laughs> was the Eldridge plaque hanging in the Norfolk Library, which does hang here today over our fireplace. Um, if you are ever in the area, please do stop by. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon and welcome Eve. Thank you so much, Anne. It's such a thrill to be here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I am particularly honored to be giving a talk um, to a Norfolk crowd. Any of you um, listening today who um, has not been to Norfolk, run, don't walk. Um, it is an area of incredible natural beauty as well as uh, gorgeously preserved and uh, well-documented architecture. So I'm gonna talk for half an hour-ish about uh, what I know and don't know about Mary Rogers Williams, how I stumbled upon the subject, how I researched her to some extent, um, why she matters amid a groundswell of interest in circa 1900 women artists, and um, why this is such a Connecticut story. So, um, I grew up in an 1830s farmhouse in Stamford, Connecticut. My mother, Renee Kahn, is uh, an architectural historian, preservation activist, um, artist, and she still lives in the 1830s farmhouse where I grew up. And it is still full of the antiques that my mother and I started collecting in the 1970s when I was a kid. We would go out every Saturday morning and we would buy ceramics and glassware and, and silver and furniture and paintings um, that interested us. Um, often it wasn't mainstream things. We tried to avoid Tiffany & Co's silver and Limoges porcelain. Also, this is pre-Antiques Roadshow. This is before everyone suspected that their heirlooms were worth fortunes. And uh, we brought things home to research them. Obviously, growing up around uh, uh, material culture like this influenced my career. I write about old things and I research and write about old things for a living. But for some reason, I never paid that much attention to the farmhouse contents as an adult. And then in 2012, spring of 2012, I happened to ask my mother about this painting, which hangs in the, the rather uh, dimly lit living room of the 1830s farmhouse. There's a dense row of 1930s rhododendrons across the front of the house. I just never paid attention to this painting. I asked my mother about it and she said she bought it in the 1970s in Coscob, part of Greenwich, where there had been, as many of you know, an artist's colony around um, 1900. It's a birthplace of American Impressionism. She bought it. It's a late 19th century piece, obviously, she said and she looked up that signature at lower right, M.R. Williams, when she bought it, and the only artist using that signature at that time would have been Mary Rogers Williams, my mother said, and I don't know much about her. I think she taught at Vassar, my mother said. So I went home and Googled her. In the spring of 2012, the internet knew almost nothing about Mary Rogers Williams. Uh, maybe born 1856, maybe born 1857, definitely born in Hartford, definitely worked at Smith College most of her career, maybe died in 1906, maybe 1907, maybe Paris, maybe Florence. Um, 
The only thing the internet was sure about her in 2012 was that in 2009, at the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut, there had been, this painting had been exhibited by Mary. It's her 1890s portrait of a, a Hartford-born artist who was a friend of hers named Henry White. Um, the Florence Griswold Museum, as many of you know, um, Florence Griswold uh, was a whaling captain's daughter who around 1900 turned her family home into a boarding house that catered to artists. And they called themselves the Hot Air Club. And they were, uh, it's a birthplace of American Impressionism. And they were making fun of themselves for also being braggarts, the Hot Air Club. They came there in the summer. So 2009, they'd had a show of Henry's pastel landscapes and they showed this portrait of him by her. And I called the museum and I said, who owns this portrait? My family also owns a painting by this woman artist. Do you think they know anything about her? And they connected me to Henry's two surviving grandsons. One is George White. He and his wife, Betsy, founded the Eugene O'Neill Theater in Waterford outside New London. Um, fascinating people is all I have met on the Mary Rogers Williams trail. Um, and uh, George's brother, uh, Nelson is his real name. Beeb is his nickname. He's an artist who lives most of the year in Florence, Italy. And I called Beeb on his cell phone and he's on a piazza sipping espresso. And I say, my family also owns a painting by this woman artist who seems to have known your grandfather. Have you ever heard of her? And he said, you're really on to something. Our grandfather adored her. Um, she was the nuts and bolts of teaching at Smith College under our grandfather's dear friend, Dwight Tryon, landscape painter. Um, we have some of her work. We, he told us to hang on to it. It's good quality. Someone might be interested someday. I'll be back in the States in a few weeks. Um, come see what we have. So I jump on Amtrak a few weeks later. And they don't have some of her work. They have a hundred of her 120-ish known surviving paintings, pastels, oil on canvas, oil on panel, watercolors. They have hundreds of her sketches, uh, mostly of women standing, sitting, staring off into space, working on textiles, uh, playing cards, reading. Uh, the paintings and pastels are mostly landscapes, handful of portraits, and they have thousands of pages of her letters. And they've got them in chronological order because it turns out that Mary, while teaching at Smith College most of her career, spent every summer she could in Europe. She spent two full years of her life in Europe and she wrote home every day to her unmarried sisters back in Hartford. And she wrote to her friend Henry every few weeks. They inherited her estate. They put everything in storage. Some of the paintings are in a boathouse, a 1910s boathouse that had been shoved inland by the 1938 hurricane that did such devastating damage to the New England coast, but to somehow spared Mary's work. And they lend me the letters and I open them right away and there's jewelry inside and there's uh, snapshots and postcards and, and receipts and a snippet of a dress she was having made in Europe and bits of confetti from a Paris Mardi Gras parade. And they lend me everything. And I start to read these letters on the ride home, the Amtrak home. And Mary is feisty and funny and self-deprecating and incredibly observant about everything. Uh, funny things waiters say, glimpses of royalty on the road, um, how men and women are treated differently on the road and on the art market. What a produce truck looks like when it pulls into a Paris market stall laden with cauliflower and radishes and carrots. Um, she barely mentions all the tragedies that befell her family. However, good Connecticut stock is how one family obituary put it. So her background, the two people in the center of the top row, those are Mary's parents. Um, Edward Williams lived from 1822 to 1871. Mary Ann French Williams, Mary's mother, lived from 1824 to 1861. They were from prosperous working class families. Um, there, there were some relatives who went to Yale. Uh, there, were, there was a relative who served in Lincoln's cabinet during the Civil War, and there was a relative who was a, a naval hero during the Civil War. This is um, Edward's father on, at top left, David Williams. Um, he had about 11 children. Um, his first wife had died young. Um, he, by the time Mary's born in 1857, the family has been farming for generations in Portland, Connecticut, actually a hamlet of Portland called Cobalt. And Portland, as you know, is across the Connecticut River from Middletown, where Wesleyan University Press, which published my book, Bless Them, is located. So um, 
Edward and Marianne French Williams have two children who die within weeks of each other in 1853, a toddler and an infant. And then they quickly have four surviving daughters, Mary's, Mary and her older and her older and one, two older and one younger sister. Mary's older sister, Lucy, on the left, lower left, born in 1853. She becomes a teacher at the Innovative School for the Deaf in Hartford, founded by Gallaudet. Mary's older sister, Abby, born 1855, becomes um, a teacher of science at the public high school next to their home in Hartford. Hartford Public High School, as many of you know, an elite institution founded in the 17th century. Mary and her sisters were all in the uh, classical track, which was co-ed, and the boys went off to Yale and uh, Trinity, and the girls, the smarter girls, the more successful girls became teachers. Uh, so Abby teaches science there. That's my Mary, born 1857. Um, 1859, lower right, Mary's uh, youngest, younger sister, Laura. She never works. She manages the household finances, and she's a linchpin of my story because she lives into the 1940s. She outlives the, the second longest lived William's sister by decades, and she keeps her uh, Mary's papers in order. She keeps Mary's artwork together, and she bequeaths everything to Henry White. Um, top right, that's little Laura and little Mary. Um, that would have been, uh, that photo would have been taken around the time that their mother died. These four people are motherless, by the time the oldest is eight, and they are orphaned by the time the oldest is 18. Um, Edward has uh, two sisters who were widowed young and lost their only children as infants. And those two sisters step in to help finish raising the Williams girls. One of the sisters is named Wilhelmina, Aunt Willie, um, and Mary visits her a lot at the, at the family farm in Portland. Um, these four people, none of them ever have a suitor, as far as I can tell. They never marry. There's no descendants on this side. And, um, but they are star students at the high school. That I do know. Um, I have their report cards. Um, top, this is um, Edward's business card. He was a prominent baker. He baked the cake for Samuel Colt's wedding, the great gunmaker marrying the future great phila philanthropist, Elizabeth Colt. It was five feet wide and four feet tall. It was the great confection of mid 19th century Hartford. Weddings and parties furnished with cake and ice cream at short notice, it says, but orders on the Sabbath will not be attended to, he wrote in one of his ads. This was a good Episcopalian family. Um, this is an image of Hartford taken from the roof of the Capitol in during Mary's youth. That's the gorgeous Romanesque public high school next to their home. They lived in one of these wood frame buildings back here. That's Hosmer Hall, a theological seminary. The school for the deaf would have been in these woods here um, off to the left outside the, uh, the the, this image would have been, um, I think it's called the Institute of Living now. Um, it was the retreat for the insane in Mary's time, and it had uh, gorgeous uh, landscaping by Frederick Law Olmsted, one of many tastemakers uh, from Hartford. Um, uh, there was a lot of money and a lot of culture in Mary's day. Uh, Mark Twain, Harriet Beecher Stowe walked the same streets as Mary. Mary knew people who knew them. Um, there were industrialists making guns, in the, so the, like the Colts, also typewriters, automobiles, uh, bicycles, and textiles. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of culture. J.P. Morgan is from, is from Hartford. Wadsworth Athenaeum, incredibly early example of a, a survey art museum in America. Uh, a map of their neighborhood. This is the public high school. Their home was one of, was probably this uh, wood frame building here. The Williams has also owned the wood frame building next door, rented it out to a bicycle uh, designer. These connected outbuildings, I believe that's where Edward's bakery business was. Um, this is the school for the deaf here where Lu Mary's sister Lucy taught. So despite all the money and culture and attractions in Hartford, uh, Mary remains something of a country girl throughout her life. Um, she goes to visit her Aunt Willie in, in the Cobalt Hamlet of Portland often, um, and she paints and makes pastels of, of Connecticut scenery wherever she travels in Europe. And she writes home um, wherever she travels in Europe that she's homesick for the Connecticut landscape. She'll be on the banks of some terribly important river in France or Germany, and she'll write home. It winds beautifully, but not as beautifully as the Connecticut River. Um, she missed her Aunt Willie's succotash when she was on the road. This is a farmhouse down the road from her Aunt Willie's farm, and you can see that she's left the toned paper visible in this pastel. That's a signature technique of hers. At one point, a Smith student was interested in buying one of her pastels, and the girl's mother came by and said, no, 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 the pastel is falling off. It's obviously badly made. The mother um, in a Philistine way, did not understand Mary's avant-garde techniques. 
Um, this is a, an image of Job's pond down the street from Aunt Willie's farm. And the pond looks amazingly like this to, to this day with a few small houses along the banks. Um, you will see these high horizons recur again and again in Mary's work. And you will also see that she was fascinated by reflections, how water turned architecture and landscape into abstract geometric forms and zigzags. Um, this is this was painted somewhere along the Connecticut River uh, Valley. We're not sure where. Um, she loved unmowed meadows. She once wrote a letter to her friend Henry saying, "Oh, I wish Aunt Willie had not had not mowed the North Pasture. It was so much more beautiful before it was mowed." She loved the rippling striations of the grass. Uh, some of her earliest sketches are of uh, the of the family farm and wildflowers there. Wherever she traveled in Europe, she wrote home comparing the wildflowers she was seeing to what she remembered from her childhood. Um, on the right, that's one of her early, also another one of her earliest sketches. It's of one of her sisters at the family farm on a split rail fence. I believe it's Laura, and she's writing or sketching. Another one of Mary's earliest sketches, this is her sister, Abby. Um, so three of the four Williams sisters are teachers, so they have the summer off. So this was how Abby was spending one of her vacations at the family farm, cocooned in a hammock. There's no explanation in Mary's letters for why her sketches like this are so tight and realistic, um, and her paintings and pastels are so much looser. You know, often it's the other way around, right? The artist does a, uh, a loose sketch and then tightens it for the final uh, painting or pastel, not explained in Mary's letters nor is there any explanation for a basic fact. Why did she decide to become an artist? Why did a baker's daughter pick that as a career? We do know where she taught, where she trained and then briefly taught in Hartford. It was called the Society of Decorative Art. It was one of many similar institutions founded in America after the Civil War. It was meant for women, uh, mothers mostly, whose uh, husbands had been killed or incapacitated in the Civil War to figure out a way to become a breadwinner when they hadn't expected to. The Society of Decorative Art um, taught women how to paint on canvas, on china, and to make textiles that could be sold for their benefit. You're looking at an image from their 1880s annual report. Their classes were originally single sex, and then they opened up to be um, co-ed. Uh, the Hartford industrialists' wives and the culturati of Hartford, their wives, were very involved in this uh, in this school, including Mark Twain's wife, Olivia Clemens, and also um, Elizabeth Colt. Uh, this is a typical classroom at the Society of Decorative Art. There's this great skeleton lurking behind the, the, the curtain, and someone sketched uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, the skull on the, on, the, on the chalkboard. There were geometric forms. Um, there were plaster casts. As many of you know, any self-respecting uh, late 19th century American cultural institution had to have a survey collection of plaster casts made from architectural elements and sculpture in the ancient medieval and Renaissance world. Um, it's not only how art history was taught for generations, it's also how fine art was taught for generations. You can see that one of the students is sketching that bust. We know that Mary had three male mentors early on. She briefly trained in New York um, in the 1880s with William Merritt Chase, the great um, educator as well as painter. And he told her she had too much timidity to succeed. She trained at the Society of Decorative Art with James Wells Champney, a Boston native, Civil War veteran, uh, an artist whose work is quite sweet and realistic. And he told her she had not enough self-conceit to succeed. And Mary briefly trained with and then worked for at the Society of Decorative Art, Dwight Tryon, Henry White's dear friend, landscape painter. Um, I find his work incredibly boring. He seems to have painted the same landscapes at dusk and twilight uh, again and again. Path goes off to the right, path goes off to the left. Um, he, many people have never heard of him. Uh, his work is not widely uh, disseminated and it doesn't come on the market that often. He was a huge favorite of the great philanthropist and collector Charles Lang Freer in uh, Detroit and then uh, Washington. Freer thought Tryon was a genius for the ages and bought up much of Tryon's uh, major uh, pieces. Um, Tryon didn't really have to work for a living because of support from people like Freer. It was said of Tryon that he was so fortunate that if he fell down a sewer, he would find a gold watch at the bottom. 
So in the late 1880s, he gets hired as uh, Smith College's, the head of their art department. And he brings Mary from Hartford to work with, to work under him at, um, in Northampton. Her title is teacher or instructor of drawing and painting. Um, she's also in charge for much of her Smith career um, for the art history classes. She does all the work. She sets up all the classrooms. She cleans up all the classrooms. She sets up the student works, the student exhibitions and, and deinstalls them. She flatters donors. Dwight Tryon's responsibilities are simply to show up on campus once every three weeks for one morning to critique what the girls are working on. And otherwise he's working um, in New York or he's at his summer home in Massachusetts or he's traveling um, along the New England coast to fish. Mary does all the work and she hates teaching. She hates the cloying embryo intellects of the girls as she describes them and her convent life in various drafty old houses at the outskirts of campus. There are a handful of advantages, however, to working at an elite women's college. There's a beautiful freestanding masonry building for the art department. You can make out the skylights in this image. Um, she also, um, there's a great art collection that early on they're collecting avant-garde of their time. Louis Comfort Tiffany, Aikens, Homer, Bierstadt, Innes. And also there are studios in the building where Mary can work and uh, sometimes sell her work and people can come sit for portraits by her. One of her repeat portrait clients is a man named George Dudley Seymour, um, Hartford native. He ends up working um, as a patent lawyer in New Haven. Um, he's a collector, a historian, a genealogist. Um, this painting of him by Mary is called The Connoisseur, and he's looking at a little Chinese vase in his hand. As is typical of Mary's portraits, the, in person there's a dozen colors in the backgrounds of these. Um, there are, there's an almost iridescent illusion of depth um, to her backdrops in her portraits. Um, one of George Dudley Seymour's other favorite hobbies is to travel, um, particularly in Italy. Giorgio is one of his nicknames, and it's possible that he inspired Mary's longtime love of travel. Her travels eventually take her from the Arctic Circle in Norway to Pestum, south of Naples, and she hikes and bikes and takes the reins of horse-drawn carriages at the edges of cliffs along the road. And she writes home every day, and she writes to her friend Henry every few weeks. This is an image from her trip to Norway, and you can see she loved these high horizons. Um, during this trip, she wrote home that she wanted to make a pastel every five minutes, if only this train would slow down. And there were men on the ship who were interrupting women. Every time a woman had um, an, an observation about geology or climate, a man would interrupt her and tell her that that couldn't possibly so be so. Um, at one point, she writes home, there's a man who's been calling himself Count Ravenstein, but we figured out that he's King Leopold of Belgium. And he's handing out diamond L pins to his favorite crew members, and he's participating in a tug of war game on the deck, and uh, Mary makes out that um, at the cuff uh, at the cuff of his fancy waistcoat, she can make out a little red strip of flannel, and she realizes that the king is wearing an extra layer, that the king is cold. This is the extraordinary level of detail, even about the ordinary, in Mary's letters. Um, she spends a summer in Chateau country, and uh, while she she travels, she's traveling there with uh, her dear friend Mabel Eager, almost undoubtedly the love of her life. I'll tell you a little bit more about Mabel in a moment. At one point, they're on a train in a tunnel, and the train catches fire, and there's a stampede to get away, and Mary and Mabel end up separated, and one person ends up grievously injured, and many of us, if we were a baker's daughter from uh, 1850s Hartford, uh, would not travel again after this traumatic experience, but Mary, nevertheless, she persisted. So uh, she spends a couple summers in Siena, and particularly there, but all along the road, she she makes friends with other interesting expat women, British, American, who are working as archaeologists, historians, uh, photographers, um, novelists. Um, also, particularly in Siena, but wherever she travels in Catholic countries, she goes to mass multiple times a day on Sundays. She is not devout. She's not even really Episcopalian by this point. Don't let it get about Hartford, she writes to Henry, but I've bought a copy of the Catholic Mass. Um, she just loved the pageantry. She loved the priest's robes and the glimpse of nuns in the choir loft and the haze of incense rising above it all. This is all what she wrote home about. She goes to Venice a few times. She doesn't feel that confident in her ability to render Venice. Too many other American artists in her mind have already been there and done the definitive images of Venice. Um, early in her, in her travels, she uh, was in London and basically invited herself over to James McNeil Whistler's home. 
and um, he gave her a tour. She decided he was a rare deer. She adored him, and she thought that he had done definitive images of Venice. There's also an artist from Hartford named William Gedney Bunce um, that Mary knew, and he traveled to Italy and painted Venice and painted similar sunsets there so often that he's known in the trade today as Yellow Bunce. He was getting on Henry's nerves at one point, and Mary wrote home, if, ben, if Bunce is bothering you, I'll buy a suit of armor in Europe, and when I get home, I'll serve as the gatekeeper at your moat in Hartford and say, get thee gone, Bunce. Um, she often wrote home about wanting to dress in men's clothing. Um, she would sit next to a soldier on a tram and long to try on his red trousers and his gold epaulets. Um, she, as, as she was almost undoubtedly gay, she uh, there's passages in her writing that sound what we would would now consider stereotypically butch. Uh, she wanted to punch a bank clerk who had delayed some letters to her from her sisters, uh, but there's nothing explicit about her love life. Mary knew, like, unlike way too many corporate titans and government officials of our time, if you have a secret about your love life that you want kept, don't put anything in print. Mary knew her letters were being passed around. One of her letters says, love Polly, that was her fa family nickname, um, and then there must have been some kind of PS because the whole bottom edge of the letter is trimmed away. And then there's another letter that says, if I have to tell you anything private, I'll send a separate private page. When she can't get to Europe, she travels along the, the New England seaboard. She's in Provincetown really early on, before there's a formal art school founded there, artist colony there. In general, she was not much of a joiner. She didn't consider herself part of any movement. When asked by an interviewer in the 1890s what style she proposed to adopt, she replied, if I cannot have a style of my own, I trust I may be spared an adopted one. Uh, people ask me if her compositions have any deeper meaning, if the three boats on the left creeping up at the one on the right suggest anything about uh, the inexorable passage of time and boats beaten back by the current, and the answer is absolutely not. She never wrote home about any deeper philosophy or symbolism embedded in her work. She simply wrote home that she had gone out to catch a sketch or find a sketch. Uh, she goes to Maine um, and Monhegan Island around the same time that people you've heard of, like Robert Henry and Rockwell Kent, are there. And she abstracts the Maine landscape down to the suggestions of wisps of foam and greenery clinging to veiny rocks. Uh, people ask me if her work became more abstract over time, and the answer is I don't know, because a lot of it isn't dated. Uh, she goes to Waterford, where Henry's family still lives um, in gorgeous shingled and field stone houses that Henry built. And um, he comes with her to visit Aunt Willie in uh, Portland. And they, they, their letters show that they loved the same kinds of moonlight and marshland and pastures. Henry had had the common sense as a young man to marry an heiress from Hartford. Grace Holbrook. Um, her family had made fortunes in, among other areas, making shoes for Civil War soldiers. Uh, Henry didn't really have to work for a living, and he had time and resources and generosity to help his friend Mary's career, and his um, descendants, bless them, have been equally generous and careful stewards. Uh, so a couple dozen of her 120-ish known surviving paintings and pastels are portraits. Um, again, you can see these multicolored striations in the background. In, in person, there's a dozen colors and an illusion of depth. On the left, that's a large um, uh, oil on canvas that looks like pastel, and on the right, that's a medium-sized pastel. Both of these were shown at the New York Watercolor Club and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Those were two of dozens of group shows that Mary participated in from Paris to Indianapolis. She also had a couple of one-woman shows and a couple of two-person shows with Henry. In the big group shows, the reviewers almost always singled out her work for mention. Some of them loved her dreamy atmospheric effects, and one of them thought she was too abstract for his tastes and needed to go through a severe course of drawing. And the reviewer that I really hate is the man who wrote that um, she wasn't copying anyone, her work wasn't derivative, and that was strange for a woman in art. Alas, no record survives in Mary's letters of how she responded when being told that not imitating anyone made it was was strange for a woman in art. Oh, one more portrait on the right. I love this one. Mary described it to Henry in a letter as a memory sketch done of a neighbor uh, glimpsed through a window by lamplight. And you can make out the glow of the table lamp at the left edge. Um, on the left, that's a photograph of Mabel Eager, almost undoubtedly the love of Mary's life. They traveled together in Europe. 
Uh, Mabel lived uh, outside of Boston. Mary would go visit her during the school year from Northampton to Boston. Um, Mabel ran her family's office supplies business. Um, she was the typewriter ribbon queen of early 20th century Boston. Um, she showered Mary with presents, uh, clothing, theater tickets, cash, um, and somewhere out there, but I can't find it, it's mentioned in the letters, is Mary's portrait of Mabel. So if you see a portrait of an apparently terrifyingly imperious woman, according to collateral descendants that I interviewed, with a premature gray streak in her hair, and it's signed M.R. Williams, let me know. Uh, so she hates teaching. Her boss, Dwight Tryon, is never there. By 1898, 1899, she's wangled a sabbatical in Paris, and it's a blowout, fun-loving year. She, is, she attends and throws countless house parties. This is my Mary pouring coffee. I could tell you what other expats said about her coffee and how often she waxed her floors and how she chose those wall coverings and what happened to these three other interesting intellectuals. She gets three pastels of Connecticut shown at the Paris Salon during her sabbatical, and um, she briefly trains with James McNeil Whistler. She'd been a huge fan of his early in her career, but when she takes classes with him, he's offering um, classes for women that are more expensive than his classes for men in Paris. Um, she realizes he's a pompous fop and a terrible teacher. He simply wants everyone's work to look like his. Um, he reads out quotes from his own writings in class, and uh, Mary Mary watches women fawn over him and she writes home what fools women can be. And she's also um, horrified to find out that when he actually needed to see anything, he took out his monocle, that it was simply an affectation. She also gets a break from teaching by going to New York a couple times a semester. Um, she uh, comes to the attention of the dealer, William Macbeth. He's an Irish immigrant. He's famed um, still to this day as the, the first major American dealer to promote American paintings as being of equal caliber and investment value um, as their European counterparts. He gives Mary a one woman show at one point, pastel landscapes. He describes them as poetic in sentiment and crisp and free in treatment in his uh, in-house publication, and nothing sells except for one pastel of Job's Pond near Aunt Willie's farm in Portland, and Mary um, finds out that it has sold and then realizes who bought it, and who bought it is her friend Henry behind her back trying to support her career. She by, the, by 1906 or so, she has seen modernism come into the New York galleries, and she loves it. The Ashcan School, uh, Robert Henry, John Sloan, she's all excited about this, this new wave of energy in art. Henry, around that time, had wanted to join the National Academy and have N.A. officially after his name, and Mary wanted nothing to do with something so mainstream. She wrote to Henry this poem, I would not be an N.A., nor with the N.A.'s hang, I'd rather join a gayer, a smarter, wilder gang. And alas, we don't know what kind of smarter, wilder gang Mary would have joined had she lived longer. So you're looking at her last uh, long-term home. This is a Paris, this is a Paris studio where she spent the last year of her life. The short version of, her, of the story of her departure from Smith, which takes up a whole chapter in my book, is that um, she'd been teacher or instructor of drawing and painting for nearly two decades. She wrote to Smith, if not promoted to associate professor, I will resign thinking they would never call her bluff. Uh, and Smith, the administration, all men wrote back, if you will resign, if not promoted, then simply resign. And she's a little stunned and she packs her things. She goes back to the same street in Paris where she had spent her sabbatical nearly a decade before. And, uh, she has a lazy last year trying to figure out what to do with herself. She gets an offer to teach American girls to paint at Giverny and turns it down. She gets a burst of energy in the summer of 1907. She goes back to Siena to her familiar haunts there and her expat friends. She starts to copy a gold ground altarpiece that she has seen in a side street chapel and she doesn't know she's dying. She has abdominal tumors that she's been ignoring for years. In September 1907, she heads off to Venice. Um, to uh, for a pastel, to create a pastel that Mabel has commissioned. Um, she stops in Florence. She stays at her usual hotel at the Arno Banks. She takes her usual hike up to Fiesole. And anyone who's been to Florence knows that's a hell of a hike. Um, she gets to Fiesole and she collapses. And she ends up um, dying in a, in a hospital in the gorgeous Florentine Hills. Um, and the hospital was founded and run by a British nurse who had trained with Florence Nightingale. So interesting expat women around Mary, even in her her last days. 
She's buried in the Allori Cemetery, the Laurel Cemetery in Florence. And um, when I went to her grave in 2017, I thought I would be so sad to see her so far from home, from her sisters that she so loved, and Connecticut that she so loved. But I got there and I realized how close um, are the graves of other interesting expats. The cemetery was founded for Protestants and then opened up to uh, various fates. She's buried right near Howard Pyle, the American illustrator. She's buried near Alice Keppel, one of King Edward VII's mistresses. And right near her is the grave of Lizzie Boot, Lizzie Boot Duvenek, who was a dear friend of Henry James and whose widower, Frank Duvenek, designed her grave marker. It is Lizzie in effigy, um, in a gown with a palm frond across her chest. It's in gorgeous patinated bronze at the Allori Cemetery, and you've seen gilded, uh, the perfect gilded version of it um, by Frank Dubinek, and it's at the Met in the American Wing, in the courtyard, and then there's a white marble version of it um, at the Boston MFA. When I went there, I put my book manuscript and uh, a binder full of photos of Mary and her work down next to her grave, which looks amazingly like this with a light overgrowth of ivy um, currently, and I said, Mary, you're going to like this book, and what I heard in my head, well, obviously, was, um, oh, you sound like my friend Henry White. You're just a sad flatterer. I heard quotes from Mary's letters in my head. So her legacy. I stumbled upon her in a funny way, as I mentioned in, uh, in 2012, because of my mother's painting. I go down this amazing rabbit hole. Within two years of the discovery of, the, of this amazing cache, the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Henry's descendants have remained involved for decades. Um, they put on um, a retrospective for Mary. It's a couple dozen paintings, pastels, watercolors. This is uh, Provincetown. These two are Maine. That's Norway. That's Cape Cod. And if you bandwidth for two more quick detective stories, um, paintings keep surfacing at the last minute as this exhibition is coming together. Uh, this one here, the woman in the white shawl, that is Mary's portrait from the 1890s of one of her landladies at Smith. Uh, Mrs. Tenney was her name. She was a beloved philanthropist. She bequeathed her estate to Smith with the proviso that rich and poor girls be allowed to live together in her lovely 18th century home right at the edge of campus, because otherwise the poorer the girl was, the, for, the further from campus she had to live and the more she struggled to keep up with her rich classmates. So this portrait of Mrs. Tenney had hung in Tenney House. There'd been a series of dorms named for Mrs. Tenney. Um, and then when I started my research in 2012, Smith's art collection, they had the accession card for this painting, but they couldn't find the actual painting. Um, it had hung in the dorm, the dorm had been renovated, and the painting had just walked out at some point. Nobody had any idea where it had gone and when it had left campus. So with enormous effort, I was able to figure out that it had come up at some provincial auction house in New Hampshire in 2008. I contacted the auction house, they connected me to the buyer, and he basically said, until you reached out to me, I had absolutely no idea who M.R. Williams was. I just bought this painting because it reminded me of Whistler mother. And I basically said, you don't want any trouble. Smith doesn't want any trouble. I don't want any trouble. There's no police report, but this painting should never have left campus. And he paid a couple hundred bucks for it. I still, I, he, I, my husband and I paid him a little more than he paid, um, bought this painting from him, lent it to the Florence Griswold Museum, and then donated it to Smith, where it will never go back into a dorm. And as my book is going into the design phases, somebody emails me out of the blue. Um, I see you've been researching Smith's art collection. Maybe you'll be interested in this circa 1900 cyanotype of a Smith dorm parlor. Am I interested? Oh my God, that's, that's my Mary's portrait of her landlady hanging in one of the Tenney House dorms. And, and those are the chairs that my Mary would have sat on, hating the cloying embryo intellects of the girls all around and hating her convent life at Smith and plotting her next trip overseas. So one more detective story wrapping up and so grateful for your attention. So my mother's painting that sets me on this journey in 2012. After I've made countless phone calls, sent countless emails to descendants of people who are mentioned in Mary's letters, do you know anything about this woman? And even finding more pastels, more watercolors, more oils on canvas, people saying, oh, you know, our grandfather or great-grandfather was a neighbor or our great-grandmother was um, obviously a client. We didn't know who this pastel signed by Mary M. R. Williams was. So deep, deep, deep down this rabbit hole, I take my mother's painting out of the 1830s farmhouse in Stamford, where I grew up, to the back porch to get a good photograph of it in bright sunlight for my catalogue raisonné of Mary Rogers Williams in progress. And when the sun hits the signature at lower right, I just double over laughing um, because it's not an R, it's a P. 
It's a P with a sloppy dot after it. And it's buried in the foreground foliage. And, and, and my mother misread the signature. My mother doesn't like this painting. If my mother were on this Zoom, and this has happened to me when I've given a Zoom lecture on this, my mother types into the chat, I don't like that painting. I bought it for the frame. I bought it for the frame. The frame goes with my farmhouse decor. So thank you. You mom for everything, including making this wonderful mistake. Um, it's a P. So the own, the, my own line of writing that I'm proudest of in the book that I couldn't quite believe that an academic press let me put keep in is this. Ma, who the bleep is M.P. Williams? And other paintings with a more legible version of M.P. Williams as a signature of turned up. There's a couple in a museum in Pennsylvania and their catalog describes M.P. Williams as probably self-taught and um, American and active 19th century. That's all we know. No. Ma, who the bleep is M.P. Williams? Um, it's not Mary's handwriting. It's not her style. Even you can't even you can't even think that it was a juvenile style of Mary Rogers Williams. The M, the M is all wrong. Mary's M's are nice and neat and symmetrical like that. They're not lumpy and and awkward like that. So it's all an accident that I sit before you today, um, rattling off Mary's story at top speed to the little green light on my laptop camera, and I am so so grateful for everyone's attention. Um, anyone who buys my book, email me, evemcon at gmail. So E-V-E-M is in Mary, K-A-H-N at gmail.com. And I will send you a sticker with your name inscribed on it so that you can have a, this will serve as a kind of virtual book signing. So grateful for your attention. So grateful to, to the Norfolk Library for hosting me today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Eve, for this uh, Remarkable story in so many ways. What a remarkable woman and what a remarkable story of research on your part. What fun to have happened upon all of that incredible material, a trove of letters. I mean, this is an historian's dream. And I often, as an historian, bemoan the fact that no one writes letters anymore. But all of your rabbit holes that you got to go down I mean, it just sounded so exciting, and I'm all ready to start investigating M.P. Williams. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Eve, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. And please do read Eve's book, which um, is wonderfully, beautifully written and uh, presents this so much more information about this remarkable artist, forever seeing new beauties, the forgotten impressionist, Mary Rogers Williams. So thanks everyone for tuning in today and we hope that we will see you at our next program.